And what I've tried to do with my microphone is give you a head start on on getting a nice brass sound. And that, that's why I built it for myself was well, I'm not particularly happy with what I have so far. And I built some things and then realized I think I've got something I can work with here. And in my own fashion, I was happy using it. And it ended up being loaned about and uh, ended up having my arm twisted and building a few more. And it's when other people started telling me you need to be selling these is when I thought, I think maybe they're right. Warning, this episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Michael Barkley. Michael is one of Ireland's finest talents. He's an amazing lead player, soloist, arranger, and educator. And now Michael is making a name for himself in the world of microphone design with his new Infinity Ribbon Microphones. Microphones built by a trumpet player and designed with the trumpet player's needs and budgets in mind. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. All right, welcome to this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast, and I am joined uh, this time by uh, a guy that I've heard so many great things about. This is actually our first time talking, and I'm really looking forward to this. It's the one and only Michael Barkley. Michael, all the way from Ireland. How are you, my friend? I'm great, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Jose. How are you? Oh, oh man, I'm doing good. It is my absolute pleasure to, uh, to have you with us. Uh, I am... Uh, like I said, yes, we, we haven't met in person, but I've heard so many uh, great things about you and, uh, you know, checking out your videos on, on YouTube and, and uh, on Facebook and Instagram and all those other wonderful places. And man, you are, you are one hell of a player. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that you've done, I, I just, I look at you and like, how, how is that coming out of that horn? Uh, <laughs> and uh then also, you know, your, your work with, uh, with uh, your microphones, and we're going to talk about that in detail. Uh, so it's just, it's a privilege for me to be able to, uh, to talk to you about uh, all these sort of things. So, so why don't we just go ahead and get started with, uh, you know, where are you located at in Ireland? Yeah, okay. So again, thanks for that wonderful introduction. I don't know that it's entirely deserved, but <laughs> I'll take it. Take a win when you can get it. Um, so I'm based in a little place called Carrickburgus, so it's north of Belfast, which is in Northern Ireland, which is confusingly part of the UK. Um, a lot of uh, our American friends may not be aware. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of history in that. Find Wikipedia yeah. and just go to town. But <laughs> I'm just outside of the capital of Northern Ireland, Belfast. And okay. for the last week, we've uncharacteristically had nice weather. Because normally it's famous for rain. <laughs> yeah, I was in Dublin about three years ago, I guess it was, and uh, was was there right around um, that between uh, Thanksgiving here in the U.S. and uh, and Christmas, and it was really interesting. Uh, the weather, um, I it rained every day. Uh, it didn't <laughs> it didn't rain all day every day, but it it, it rained every day. But uh, it, it was really beautiful. I enjoyed my time over there, and I was really disappointed to get a chance to get up to uh, Belfast because uh, we really wanted to go a little further north, but we had limited time. So, uh, but I did I did get a chance to go to an actual uh, Irish whiskey distillery. So that was uh, and actually I have a bottle of it sitting uh, right here. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's uh, Teelings. Uh, so their uh, their distillery is located in Dublin, and uh, we went on the tour of the factory, and it became like one of my one of my go tos. So uh, I, I thought I would, in honor of you, I would I would have a little glass uh, while we're talking. So yeah, I don't hold that against you. That's a great drink, actually. Love it. Uh, uh, so are you are you a uh, a a whiskey or a beer drinker? Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really do like good whiskey, and. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if I could pinpoint a favorite because I think there's so much great character in all of them, but 
There's a particular whiskey from West Cork, which I'm quite fond of. And it's particularly dark in its color. And the overtones are quite like burnt caramel. And mm. it's quite Moorish. I like that. <laughs> What's the name of it? I The branding's just West Cork. West says Cork? On it. Yeah, oh. so maybe there is a, a distillery and that's that particular bottle. But mm. I have a, a small remaining amount hidden away. <laughs> uh, uh, very good very good i have to keep my eye out for that so um with your playing uh are you doing primarily uh you know small band work recording i know you, you do a little bit of of everything so what's kind of been your your go-to these days in terms of my employment it's been everything in this room for the last year plus as you might imagine uh, we just switched gears and had to start working on uh well i've always done arranging but uh trying to arrange and record sessions a lot more at home and i built this room uh, about uh nine seven eight or nine years ago uh to facilitate you know good home recordings so you need to control acoustics and so on so i invested a little bit in that um my work before this would just be a lot of function band work and whatever came my way I, I love playing small group but the opportunities in ireland to do that are festivals and then not very often so as much as i love that and playing you know free or playing post bop or bebop or whatever it happens to be the opportunities are slim so i kind of focus on um, my own uh, strengths i guess and the employment is function band work and that's yeah what I've pushed and now I'm seeing the value of all of the home self-led self-produced uh, work both as a an opportunity to advertise yourself but an opportunity to enable other people to get horns on the record for example um, yeah. yeah it just I guess at the moment uh, diverse sessions but all taking place in here yeah so yeah. with with your um with, with your setup, I, uh, will this be a perfect segue into the things you're doing with, uh, with Barkley mics? Um, I, you know, so many people are now having to record at home, like you said, and, and hopefully let's, let's keep our fingers crossed that this is going to change, um, very soon. But, uh, you know, for most of us, you know, the primary source of our creative outlet has been at home and doing home recordings and home broadcast and things like that. Um, but microphones are such um, such a difficult thing to deal with for for most musicians. Uh, I mean, if you have if you're a top flight musician and you're you know rolling in the dough, then then it's not a problem. But for the average working musician, uh, you know, or the part time musician, the you know the the new like college grad who's who's trying to make it in the business, um, it can be kind of daunting. It can be kind of an expensive uh, proposition. So uh, with your ex expertise term, in terms of doing uh, the design and manufacturing of microphones and uh, in doing the, this kind of session work yourself, uh, what are some of the big obstacles that you see and, and how are the things that you're doing with Barkley Mics helping to bridge the gap and, and make technology a little easier for people to deal with? Very good question. You nailed down the core of uh, my route to building microphones, so to speak. There's a few little tributaries there feeding the same question. When I started my interest in microphones, I was too broke to afford much more than what you need to gig live. And you can get good recordings with skill from an SM57 or a 58, but it's not your ideal in a, a studio scenario. So. I'm a technically minded person. My father is as well. And I've learned an awful lot about electronics and building anything basically uh, from him. And I've always had this sense of, well, I think I can do this when I, when I think about it. And when I see what's involved, I, I don't have blocks that, no, obviously I'm not going to sit and think okay I'm going to make a spaceship but I don't have those little blocks in my head that say this is particularly hard or I'm not 
you know, skilled to do this. I decided, okay, it's something I want to do. So it's something I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and the microphones are that way. It, they're not particularly complicated things. Um, but you need to know what you want from it before you start. Otherwise, sure, you can make something that'll get sound, but you might not get the sound you want. Um, so in terms of what, uh, characteristics, uh, home, home recording people, let's say straight from grad school want to start in, in let's say a social media presence and want to start promoting themselves. Um, one of the things you notice with microphones is there's an inherent oddness to the character of some of the cheaper, specifically condenser microphones. Right. And you might not be able to put your finger on it and you might get a nice recording and feel this is quite good, but there's always something that when you hear obviously the work of a great studio, there's a, an immense amount of skill there, but there is also the gear aspect. And one of the things is the ribbon microphone, specifically the one I've designed, but ribbon microphone designs are quite complementary to the sound of brass instruments. So they don't typically accentuate the areas of sound that have a nasty quality that otherwise small and large capsule condensers can. Now, they're not unusable, but if you're going to plug it in and your skill level is I've connected my XLR into my interface, my interface into my recording software, and that's the extent of your skill, you're not going to get the same quality uh, as you will from simply plugging a ribbon microphone in. Off the bat, you're ahead. So the sound is tailored for brass. Now, when you're working on your skill set, I think, anybody in this um this particular job market that we're in right now they need to realize that you have to develop your media skills right um which involves video production you need to involve uh, and develop your skills at electronic music production and part of that is using each and every part of the software to your advantage the equalizer compressor reverbs and then learning about the more technical things like gain staging and um you know loudness metering and so on but it's a it's a technical and broad subject and what i've tried to do with my microphone is give you a head start on on getting a nice brass sound and that, that's why i built it for myself was well, i'm not particularly happy with what i have so far and I built some things and then realized, I think I've got something I can work with here. And in my own fashion, I was happy using it. And it ended up being loaned about and uh, ended up having my arm twisted and building a few more. And it's when other people started telling me, you need to be selling these is when I thought, I think maybe they're right. Um, right. When you have enough people whose opinions you truly trust, um, it's kind of, it's encouraging, let's say, and avoids that self echo chamber. I don't necessarily, I have confidence in what I can do, but I don't necessarily uh, have the confidence to say, okay, well, now I am a microphone company without hearing words back from people like, uh, you know, Vinny Chiselski and Trent Austin and so on, who have been massively supportive of, of what I'm doing, but when these guys are coming back and saying these are great, uh, it, it brings me a great deal of happiness and um, confidence in what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate that. Well, that's great. I mean, and, and I think in many ways it's some of the greatest innovations have come because someone is dealing with a problem. There's a, there's a limitation to whatever it is you're doing, whether it's in the in microphones or the development of the trumpet or, or in any aspect of technology or, or new uh, approaches to things, it basically becomes, you know, something like, you know, hey, I'm I'm really not happy with the results I'm getting because of these limitations. Um, if no one else can figure out how to do this, I'm just gonna I, I'm gonna work on it myself, and I'm gonna do what I need to do for myself. And then, you know, for so many people, I think it never gets beyond that. It never even gets beyond the the adaptations that you make for yourself. But then when it does begin to catch on, I mean, that's when things can really take off. And I 
think with like you think about microphones, um, you know, the, the, the big names, the, the names that we all know, you know, the Shores, the uh, uh, Sennheisers, you know, and with rib, in the ribbon word, uh, world, the Royers, the, uh, uh, you know, things like that. Those were developed by audio engineers, but I really don't think any of them were particularly developed by someone who was really seriously and intimately in need of something for brass. And I think somebody, you know, designing a designing a microphone for a trumpet player with with the needs of a trumpet player in mind, um, that's a game changer. That really is a game changer. So, uh, you know, when when you're when you're going through that process and you're, and you're like, well, I I'm not happy with what I have. Uh, what were the things that you were unhappy with, and how did you come apart? How do you come up with the solutions to those problems? Yeah, good question. The um, well, there are a number of things. The uh, there is a harshness with uh, with condenser microphones, and I wasn't particularly happy with their SPL sound pressure level handling, because you know yourself, the trumpet at the firing end is particularly loud, especially if you're oh, yeah. tracking um, somewhat closer than you might want to. So. If we could talk just for two seconds about that, in smaller rooms, when we're trying to record, we're trying to get a nice dry sound so that when it goes to your clients that they're able to apply equalization and effects and not have a lot of artifacts from the acoustic we're in. So the most simple way to visualize this is imagine playing your trumpet in um, your bathroom versus playing it in your closet full of coats. Right. One is particularly lively, and maybe you don't want that sound on tape. And the other one, it's a dead sound. It's not a flattering sound, but it is a sound that can be morphed into something that sounds more realistic. And part of what we're doing with the microphone in that scenario is by moving it closer to the bell, we're minimizing the sound of the room versus the sound of the trumpet. Mm -hmm. So when you do that with particular designs of microphone, like the um, small and large capsule condensers, there's a limitation on their sound pressure level handling. So I find if I was recording, I typically record at about two feet, thereabouts. Uh, I find that I was able to saturate or clip most preamps and or uh, membranes. So there's different types of sound to capsule distortion versus preamp distortion, and neither you want in your sound. Um, so I got to thinking about, well, other microphones, other designs of microphones are a little more tolerant for sound pressure. And the most tolerant is the ribbon microphone. So uh, I can play as loud as I possibly can on the microphone and there's no distortion. So that's a massive advantage. Um, it's not a rugged design, a Harman mute can pop the little element in here, mm -hmm. but in terms of vibrational energy, uh, they're uh, the most tolerant to uh, dynamics and volume. So it maintains a quality of sound at your strongest dynamic. So that's a massive advantage. Yeah, yeah and that, that um, always kind of confused me, though, that, you know, ribbons have, uh, they, they can deal with such high SPL, but they are so freaking delicate in terms yeah. of the way you can handle them. Yeah, I'll explain why. It won't take long. They handle vibrational energy. So if you can imagine your wavelengths vibrating the little motor in here back and forwards, it's only able to move that fractions of a, an inch, thousandths of an inch. At your strongest um, forte on a trumpet, I doubt you could see it move. And you're putting in enormous amount of sonic energy. But as the vibration goes forward, it comes back very quickly thereafter. As the, the frequency, the vibration is a wave which reflects and comes back on itself. So it's never DC where it's constantly flowing. 
Right. Uh, unlike if you blew an airstream like that, that's more like a DC energy where you're blowing a stream of air that's consistently pushing this ribbon motor forwards. And with it being, let's say, three or four times thinner than human hair, um, it doesn't tolerate much of that. So, and that, that actually brings into question probably the most common thing I get asked uh, by trumpet players is uh, about the Harmon mute. And that's the one that will toast this in no time. <laughs> because I'm sure you've played with the Harmon and felt the air right. flowing through um, the, the little exit uh, where the stem would be. And if you're playing close, that DC flow will pop the ribbon. Whereas you can't feel any air passing through the bell without a mute in it. And therefore we have no issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same reason you see singers use pop shields. Not only does it catch the plosives, it stops puffs of air entering the microphone itself. Uh, and those little puffs um, will pop this in no time flat. But again, with the pop shield, I've one down here, you put it up in front of the microphone and you can have a heavy metal singer just scream at that thing and it'll be fine. So it's just the difference between um, vibrational energy and this direct flow of energy. Right. Um, I think I went a little bit off topic on oh, that. Oh, no, 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 no. That's absolutely, <laughs> that's absolutely great. You know, because that's one of the things that, you know, when, when we think about a, a, a new trumpet player, a budding trumpet player, someone who's trying to establish themselves and, uh, you know, doesn't have the savvy of somebody who's, you know, been in the studio for decades or, you know, toured and things like that. That's one of the areas that they really don't know a whole lot about. And it's so critical, especially like you're saying, you know, technology is it's required. Now you have to understand these things if you want to build a career, let alone maintain one that you already have in existence. But, um, you know, these concepts about microphones, you know, what microphone to use, what kind of placement do you need to use? Uh, you know, the, things like that, if you're going to do recording, unless you're an audio engineer, if you're, if you're you know, if you're majoring in, in music production, okay, you're going to learn some of this stuff. But if you're someone who's just uh, getting a degree in education or in performance, you're not getting this information. And it's stuff that you have to kind of learn on the fly. And as you were saying, you know, if you're going to go down the, the road of the ribbon, that's the best, you know, ribbon, ribbon mics, you know, that's the thing. You listen to all those great recordings with uh, the Jerry Hayhorn section and, and, you know, those are, those are the Royal ribbons, you know, and, and so many great mm -hmm. players use ribbon microphones. And again, if you can afford thousands of dollars on a microphone, that's great. But if you don't know what you're doing, it's easy to fry one of those. And, you know, who's got, if you're just graduating from college, who's got, an extra two grand laying around that you can, you know, go through every couple of months when you're, when you're frying your ribbon. So, <laughs> uh, you know, these kind of things, understanding what to use, why to use it and how to use it. These are the practical skills that I think are really missing for so many players. And, and the, the earlier they can learn this stuff in their career or for the older player who just is trying to, you know, navigate into this, the, the world of, of new technology, you know, the, the better you understand it, the better decisions you can make. And that ultimately becomes about being able to produce your music, to express your music without the limitations that improper use of technology give you and, you know, giving you just the best bang for your buck. So, you know, man, you're just, yeah. you're, you're spot on on this stuff. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Actually, if I grab a, a Harman mute right now, I'll show you a couple of tips I've got. Uh, for using ribbons where you won't toast it. Oh, absolutely. Three seconds. I have some mutes. Ah, you, I'll tell you the story behind this one. Uh, and then I'll tell you, um, let me see if I can get that in frame. That's a particularly well, that's battered looking. Joe Ryle. <laughs> so there is a little story behind this. Okay. Um, I was playing a theater installation piece by the Accidental Theater Company 
called The Lost Martini. And this was a, it's an immersive theater piece where the audience were part of the performance. Okay. So they set up in a, an old office building uh, in Belfast. They turned it into like a, so it was meant to be like a Parisian bar setting with jazz music. And they had cocktail bars. They had actors that were part of the plot, but no one knew they were actors. And people were overhearing conversations. And a story emerged throughout the the night. Um, very creative concept. Okay. Uh, a lot of fun to be part of. And part of the playing was we were to sign, play jazz music for a few hours throughout the night and not be too obtrusive. So I just said, well, I can play on a harmon mute and it'll, we'll play stuff Miles Davis style. Right. And we'll not turn up too much because really it was about the talking and about the ambience it created. So we had fun, we played, uh, and the theater company were pretty happy. But the guy uh, who was running this said, well, there is a bar um, we're serving martinis. It's part of the story. And he said, well, help yourself to martinis. Oh, my. Um, That's a gig. In, when you feel like it. And so we had a couple of martinis and we're playing along a couple more. And I remember that Bobby Shoe article where he said, you know, the dented harmon mutes sound better and you know, they resonate better and they, et cetera, et cetera. I'd done it before. I knew it was true. Well, uh, as the martinis were going <laughs> one night, uh, I took the concept just a little bit further than I ought to. Uh -huh. um, there was a, a hammer beside the stage from uh, assembling something. It was just at the back, and I was grabbing this on a break, and I was like, this is a great idea. I'm going to make the most resonant harmon mute you've got. And I battered this one. <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. It actually sounds and records really well. So, um, well, there is. I, I, I did buy a replacement that looked good. Um, just another Joe Rowell that looked pristine. And this one sounds better. So I sold it. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, anyway, um, let's get on to the tips then. So, we've got a ribbon microphone here. And one of the first things you might want to do is imagine the trumpet bell, play straight on it, because you're trying to get that intimate jazz sound. And like I described, playing straight on it, the air is going to be coming through from the center, and it's just going to toast this. So you can use a little um, pop filter. I'll grab mine here, attached to my stand. Oh, so you can use a pop filter. You can make these. These are not particularly complicated. A pair of tights and coat um, hanger. A coat hanger, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and you can make these. They're also not expensive, so I just bought one. Um, we can play with this, and we can have the harmony mute, but you're still going to have this kind of want to really get on the microphone. Believe it or not, the closer you get to this, the less effective it becomes. And when you get right against this, the air is still coming through the back. So it's kind of human nature, especially listening on cans, you're playing and getting close to the sound that I want. And you get close up on it and then you pop the thing. So very simple tip is if I'm playing with this as it is right now, standard configuration or the standard way up um there's a few ways i can play below the microphone knowing that my tendency as a trumpet player is i track down and to the left a little bit mm -hmm. so i know that if i go for something i'm moving away from the ribbon so i'm not likely to pop this if you happen to do the opposite and your bell moves upwards you might just want to do the reverse of what i'm saying right because you're you're talking about your own emotional state of playing. If you get into something, the last thing you're thinking about then is what's the microphone doing? And so just think, okay, if I do this, I might move this way. So I'm going to play just below. And in fact, when I play with a ribbon microphone, 
and a Harmon mute. I invert the microphone and I'll be playing. Imagine this is upside down and I'll be playing with the bell like this. Now, this sound is kind of, um, it's got a lot of bass presence and it doesn't have a lot of zing. Mm -hmm. So if you go into your equalizer and roll off some of your bass, so just make some cuts and then with a rhythm microphone, you can make enormous cuts and boosts with your equalizer to bring that zing and that snap back in. Just lift everything, uh, a good bump at 1.2 kilohertz, and then maybe from two and a half kilohertz up, do quite a significant boost. And you'll find that, okay, you're starting to bring in this Harmon sound. And with a little bit of care and attention, you can get a beautiful Harmon microphone sound or Harmon mute sound from this microphone uh, and ribbons in general. But they do take a little more financing than most. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my tip is I try to think of ways of playing past the microphone without endangering it mm -hmm. in a spontaneous movement. Um, and of course, there is no harm in any case of using one of these pop filters and that can that can just be a little bit of insurance yeah that's cool that's a good tip uh you know i i have i've recorded with ribbons before i've never had to use a harmon with it it's always just been you know kind of straight ahead playing so um yeah that's that's certainly a certainly a good tip when yeah, and when you're talking about um, you know the boosting boosting and cutting frequencies, um, you know, like I said earlier, I, I think so many people don't have any level of understanding on how to set EQ, how to use compression, limiting things like that. Um, and I think sometimes people just think, you know, I guess like you said earlier, you know, just you, you get the mic, you plug in the XLR, and you play and there it is but there's you know when you listen to the great sounding players certainly they're great sounding they're great sounding regardless of of the situation but when you're when you're printing the tape or in this case you know the disc or to to digital formats uh there has to be a level of sweetening that goes on to get that sound and to get that sound consistently so um what was your journey into the world of equalization and uh you know was this mostly just trial and error and you know recording yourself and going god that sounded like shit and what are you like that better <laughs> or, or was it you know or did, did you, you did you do kind of like you know go down the rabbit hole and you know start doing the research and and things like that you know what what's your what was your process it, kind of a bit of both i'm i'm one of these kind of slow slash fast learners where I'll probably do it wrong until it annoys me enough that I have to do it right. And then I go kind of full tilt at whatever I'm doing in terms of studying it and researching it. So yeah, I kind of, I did all that frustrating stuff and I, I, I did intuitively what I thought was correct. And I, I didn't do what I needed to do, which was uh, go ask some engineers uh, what books you should be reading. Go ask them where you can study, say, one-off lessons or what they do with horns. Um, quite often, uh, you might find that there's someone in your friends list that does this for a living. You know, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk about what things are. So use your resources that are more and more available with everyone being so interconnected the resources are there, so exploit them. Um, and then apply a little bit of logic to your approach. So equalization is a very, very useful tool. And one of the things that it can do is, apart from helping the instrument sit better in the mix and emotionally serve a song or serve a project, which is sort of that's high order or, or top tier stuff where that's an engineer or a producer's job. Um, what it can do in a more low level technical area is get you a sound that you otherwise might've got in a better room. 
in smaller rooms, and most of us are going to be in smaller rooms, um, we're going to have little frequencies that tend to resonate, and we can use equalization to remove these frequencies. So um, I'll give you a few terms, and I, I'm not going to go into the depths here. So this is hit pause and go and Google this stuff okay. because um, this will find this will help you find some of the problem areas and it'll help you um, isolate and fix your stuff. So um, the resonant frequency of small rooms is somewhere between three and four hundred hertz, usually speaking, and in that area is a strange boxiness, which makes things sound a little bit hollow. So the first thing you want to do is to create a notch filter and remove that frequency. So in your software, you create this band point and to locate the frequency, I tend to do two things. The first is, and this is kind of about learning the frequency. I sit and listen and I see, are there notes that seem disproportionate to another, especially in the lower register? Are there things not in my playing, but in the room that I'm hearing that's not right? And I spend a lot of time teaching myself to try and hear frequencies. So I can try to pinpoint these a little bit quicker. But one of the ways I taught myself was I created a notch filter. And instead of making the cut, which looks like a little V, I made a boost and sweep it in these low frequencies and listen for a strange kind of boxy sound. You'll know what it's sound. You'll know what I'm talking about when you do this and hit pause at the most resonant part of this and then pull that little peak and just pull that down until it becomes a dip and maybe dip that three to six decibels. And that's probably your first stage to minimizing your room uh, impact on the sound. Now, there's a, a dial called the Q, which is the width of this notch. The less sound that you suck out of your recording, the better. So uh, if you can narrow the Q until you can just about hear it coming back in and then open it a little further, you've kind of done the least that you need to do to get an adequate sound. Another thing would be I like software um, high pass filters rather than hardware and a high pass filter is a filter which passes higher frequencies so uh, if you set this and I prefer to set for trumpet I set this at about 80 hertz with a 12 or 24 decibel per octave roll off so a steep roll off um, what this does is it discards the frequencies below this and it does so in a little tapered fashion. So they're not surgically removed, they're diminished until you don't hear them. And in these low frequencies is where you get rumble. So rumble is something that if you're stacking 10 or 12 trumpets, all those bass frequencies are gonna keep stacking. And if you have rumble in the recording, you're stacking a messy sound. So there's two areas that I like to make cuts. And when we're talking about cuts and equalizers, I'll give you this one for free. In the SM57, there is a frequency boost to help with the intelligibility of speech and the intelligibility of uh, the singing voice. And the boost is in around the five to seven kilohertz region. And it's substantial, I believe, five or six decibels of boost. And unfortunately for us trumpet players, that's one of the nastiest sounding parts of the instrument. So if Hmm. you are limited to using a 57 or a 58, and I actually, I played trumpet on a, a big band record a few years ago, and we had a bunch of microphones up, um, before I was building these and the engineer ended up going with the 58. Uh, it sat better in the mix. This is a, a guy with 20 years experience going through 10,000, 20,000 pounds of gear 
Right. So it had all the helping hands it could. Mm -hmm. But it is a good sounding recording. And that means you, you shouldn't feel limited by what you have. And the same goes for your camera gear. Like everybody has got a phone, smartphone. That's your starting point for making your social media uh, platform for your work. So I like that idea of you use what you have. Those are your tools. Don't use excuses to not do things. But at the same time, uh, SM58s are limited. But if you make a, a little cut or maybe a big cut between five and eight kilohertz uh, and you cut that, say, three decibels. So if you imagine your graph going across and just dip down and back up, um, you will probably make your sound a little more pleasant on the trumpet. Um, and then because we're talking about recording in small rooms, there is a tendency for the instrument to get dull in a small room um, if it's well treated like this room. And well treated doesn't necessarily mean design panels. It could mean you've got every coat and rug in the house on the walls. <laughs> Yeah. Again, going to that idea of you use what you have. If the if your ends justify the means, you, you get all those rugs and you hang them up. That's what I used to do. Um, if you need to use you know, plaster scaffolding and hang coats and bedding around it to make yourself a booth. Again, these are things I've done. Just do it um, because you'll learn by doing it. But you're going to find in the more deadened acoustics that in around the 1200 hertz region to maybe 2.5 kilohertz in that little area which you would probably call the upper mids um you're going to find that's lacking and a little boost in that area can help but a little boost in that area can make the trumpet sound a little nasal so you have to be quite judicious and again trust your ears it's the same as your instrument you're learning a sound based skill so i think i think you just have to use the final arbiter in that case is did what i just do make things worse or better um and like i'd said you need a little bit of um logic to what you're doing so if you're making a lot of cuts and changes and you're exploring software and this and this and this try and have some consistent parts of your procedure so keep the microphone in the same place play the same horn play the same mouthpiece play the same repertoire and make back-to-back -back recordings and change one variable at a time and that does include microphone position horn mouthpiece um, but try and keep the variables to a minimum so that what you do learn is more valuable yeah yeah and you know that that's actually a really good point uh, just in general, that when when people want to to make any level of change, whether it's in uh, you know the, the recording, trying to get a different sound of the recording, whether it's trying to get a different sound of the horn in general, or any aspect of life, you know you're you're not happy with your you know your mental state or your physical state or or whatever it is, the tendency is to try and change everything at one time, as opposed to let me change one thing. And see if that thing makes a difference. And if it does make a difference, good or bad, then you know what to do. And then you go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing uh, until you kind of get it dialed in. As opposed to if you change everything, then you have no idea what it was that actually worked. And then when you have to make those kind of adjustments again, then you, you just don't know where to start. So uh, there's actually a guy um, who's written a number of books and blogs and things like that, Tim Ferriss. And he talked about uh, the idea that, that he has of um, when he wants it to see how something is going to work or how it's going to change, he'll do something like 180 degrees different than the way he's been doing it, but he does it for like one day. He's yep. like, I'm not going to do it long term. I'm just going to do it for one day. And if it works better, okay, I keep it. If it doesn't work better, I just wasted a day. But, you yeah. know, it's like, you know, if you change your embouchure and you change your mouthpiece and you change your horn and you change all these things, you know, and you do it for a month to try and dial it in, then you can end up setting yourself back for for years. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that the more things you change, the more 
variables become variables of one another and then all of a sudden it's a bit of a tailspin and you're worse off. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. So let me ask you with um with your recording processes, uh, because you know, I've seen some of the stuff you've been doing, you know, you've been posting these videos of uh, some of the tracking sessions that you've done. So when you're, um, when you're, you, you're the arranger, you're the player, you're the engineer to a degree, well, you are engineering your, your own tracking session. Uh, and in some cases you may actually end up being the, the producer. Um, it, you know, when you have those different tasks, um, there's certainly overlap, but there's a level of, it has to be a different approach that you take mentally to each of those things. Uh, do you try not to let uh, Michael, the, the the microphone designer, get in the way of Michael, the trumpet player, uh, as you're going through, the, you're going through your processes and you're doing your recordings and things like that? Oh, for sure. I think each and every aspect of what you do, they feed into one another in, in a way, and you, you do need to respect that. But you also, for clarity of work and for clarity of thought, need to compartmentalize, I think, as well. And that means when I'm arranging, I'm thinking solely of what serves the song and what serves the project. And I can't think, oh, this week my chops aren't feeling great or... Maybe this week my jobs are feeling great and I want to play loads of high notes in this arrangement. And it's like, all of that must not feature even remotely. Um, it's what fits the song and that's that. And that's my little compartment that I have for my arranging. And I mean, speaking about arranging, one of the things that I think is most useful are boundaries. And specifically, if I sit down with the task of writing myself a piece of music for the sake of writing a piece of music, I'll probably not be able to do it until I define some limitations. And that's why I find working on other people's music extremely refreshing because I tend to be able to do it quite quickly and quite intuitively. I can hear instantly it. No, this is a dialogue when it comes to arranging. So We've obviously at this stage talked about what the process is and what the project is, what it means to the client uh, and what the music should be saying. So all of that's a given. And with those sets of parameters in my head, I can easily think what serves the music the best. And I find it pretty easy to do when it comes to writing myself some music and I don't do those little things. I'll just sit and not be able to complete something because the a the the goal is not there the structure is not there and that's a very important thing to be aware of is well this is um it, it's partly human condition stuff where i think you need to know yourself and know your own processes but i think this is quite universal in i think people's approach to the the tasks they they confront themselves with is uh, I think they need to break them into their component parts a little further if they are struggling with them um, maybe that speaks to some of what we touched on when you mentioned Tim Ferriss before as well I've I've read some of his stuff and like it um, but yeah so that that's one compartment and I think in each compartment of this, there's a certain amount of creating boundaries and rules. And I, I do it in my practice in so far as I have a set of goals that I want to accomplish. And I try to not overly spend too much time on one thing. Um, and recently inspired by one of Jens Lindemann's videos, I picked up a countdown timer to actually a little more stringently time myself and he says 10 minutes per task hyper focused 10 minutes per task move on so the brain doesn't fall into its own little comfort right. cycles and then become slow um and this is a, a thing that you can do in your arranging and in all of these aspects is one aspect can eat up a day easy 
So you have to remember these other aspects are there. So um, the little countdown timer trick is something maybe to implement not just in trombone playing, but in other things, if you struggle with your time management. But speaking just about the, the countdown timer, I'll swear I've never met a clock that goes faster when I'm transcribing and slower when I'm doing long notes. Uh, yeah, there you than, go. Than when I put that thing on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think I think that that uh, that blew Einstein's time dilation equation right out of the water. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah it, it was really quite shocking sitting the other day, and I heard this great uh, Lee Morgan line, and I was working on it. And typical, like, Lee's semi-quaver lines are, they're beautiful and they bounce. And they're not always the easiest thing to play on the trumpet. And I'm chipping away and then look at the timer and 10 minutes is gone. And then later doing Schlossbergs and you look at the timer and you're like, oh, it's 10 minutes. And, you know, three have gone. Yeah, past. exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's quite funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great stuff. Um, with um, with your arranging uh, processes and uh, in in general, like when you when you're when you're tracking yourself, do you use multiple setups uh, for that? Do you switch microphones or do you switch horns, mouthpieces, or things like that to try and avoid phase issues? Yeah, good question. Very good question. It's probably the first thing you're going to hear if you haven't done it before is playing, uh, especially if you're multi-tracking and doing stacks of a part where you're playing in exact unison with yourself. Things can sound fizzy. And I will say this, the better you get as a player, the less that happens. But at the same time, it's there and it is a legitimate thing. So a few things do help, like you said, Changing horn or changing mouthpiece is kind of a a, a, a long considered studio trick that I learned from uh, a great, great player and mentor of mine, Mike Smith in Tampa, in Florida. Uh, and he hit me to that trick of two setups, you know, two different horns, and it helps it sound more like a real section. If you put yourself in a in each player's seat and think, Let's talk big band for trumpet players. We'll think about each player in each of those seats. What what are they going to be sounding like? And try and be those four players. So thinking a little abstract like that, what are these different players going to sound like can help. And part of that will be potentially gear change. Um, in terms of the microphone, I don't typically change microphones very much at all. Um, I might change position. That's a good point. Um, I like to keep the tonality and the predictability of the one mic setup, but I will probably change positions based on what part I'm playing. And I have uh, two B flats that I tend to play everything on. Some days one likes me more than the other, and you know how that goes. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> you play the fun one for the high stuff and you know, make the other one work. But I, I do myself personally change my pieces on, on lower parts. Uh, if, if it sounds right. Um, the great thing is it, it doesn't take very long to do a pass of, you know, a short section, five, 10 second section, track everything you plan to track, uh, and try a couple of things. Like I'll set aside the first 15 minutes of a session to warm up, but also while I'm warming up, I might stack a few things and just see what's sounding right that day. And that includes moving the microphone and uh, playing stuff on different mouthpieces. And, you know, you can trick yourself as well into thinking I have to do it this way today. And it's not always the case. So, yeah. And just a big picture stuff. And this probably makes sense to anybody. Um, lower parts on bigger gear. And I actually like brighter like a 37 on lower parts because it's slightly more focused. Um, so I might play a 3C with a 37 on the low parts uh, and maybe my Yamaha um, kind of parts horn with a Vizuti mouthpiece on the top parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So just kind of tweaking stuff to get the get get the the right sound for the job on that. Yeah, I think yeah. experimentation is probably like a, a a very good keyword for everything audio that we're talking about today. You know, the recording process, equalization, reverbs, choice of mouthpieces, horns, mic position, experimentation would, would be the the main thing, and also. Um, I keep a notepad on my stand, so if if I'm changing something, I do make little notes for myself. And at the first, I thought this is being just a little bit anal, and I, I don't need to do this. So I stopped doing it for a while, and then kicked myself when I reviewed a section, and I thought that I want to go back and record in the same way. And then I realized I didn't take a picture of my setup, and I didn't make notes about what I did. Mm. Um, and it's not like lost art or something and you can find it again it's just the convenience of knowing i set everything here here were my settings uh because part of this is also well can you do things in a reasonable time frame right um because i mean i'd love to spend all day on everything but it's not always possible so mm -hmm. yeah efficiency of, of the procedure um one other thing to say since we did talk about creating a, a and avoiding the phasey sound is a uh, double track on flugelhorn um can really help with that um you might consider a, a less fluffy sweet flugelhorn mouthpiece um maybe leaning towards the cornet trumpet sound but i find double tracking on flugelhorn can be quite good it's quite a fat sound yeah yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's amazing, you know, um, having had the opportunity to to talk a few times with with the man who's been like my, you know, the the person I've I've admired the most over the years, which is Jerry Hay, and talking oh, with Jerry about you know some of the things that that those guys did in the studios in terms of yeah. double tracking and uh, you know doing you know speeding tape up or doing things yeah so all these all the little studio tricks yeah it's like oh that's how you got that sound now again those guys sound great you know regardless of of what they're doing they're going to sound yeah, great yeah. doing it but there there were some little things that they did in the studio that that just gave that kind of extra layer of intricacy to what yeah. was already going on and it's and you couldn't put your finger on it's like why does that sound so amazing? Why does this sound so fat? Why does this sound so brilliant? Yeah. And, and like you said before, the uh, necessity being the mother of invention kind of concept. Um, it may even have been on uh, one of your videos with Jerry where he mentioned um, panning the brass was a limitation of the track count. Um, so we would, if I'm remembering correctly, um, it would be hard pan trumpets and trombones and saxophones, and then they would swap over channels on the next pass. Yeah. Um, no, I might be misremembering that slightly, but um, certainly that that concept of a limitation of track count, yeah, leading to that fat brass sound. Like Jerry's my idol in terms of all horn, all things pop horns. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. Uh, it's it's probably some of the earliest horn section stuff that I remember in pop music mm -hmm. from the Michael Jackson stuff when I was a kid. And I've just always loved that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was just some, some amazing stuff, you know, amazing players again. I mean, it's not that, that they're, you know, using studio, studio trickery uh, yeah. so much to do it, but they did. And I know uh, Jerry, uh, he gives a lot of credit to, to Bruce Swedeen who yep. was the the engineer for a lot of that stuff Quincy was doing. And, and Bruce Bruce was the guy who, I guess, helped him kind of codify the, their approach to the section when um, uh, roughly, I'm trying to remember how he, what Bruce exactly said, or something like, remember that uh, you know, a whisper turned up is still a whisper, but a scream turned down is still a scream. Yeah, and, and that's, that's heavy. Yeah, and that, that thing of like, you know, we just go for it and just put forth this volume of sound that can be adjusted. And, and I know sometimes I would fall into the trap of if I'm, you know, if I'm tracking 
and it, the the song is a little laid back of, of trying to trying to lay back a little bit too much and that yep. while it feels good in the room it doesn't translate on the track because there's there's a lack of the brilliance that you would get just through the the natural uh ambient sound if you're in the room there's going to there's going to be a feeling that you get that's just not it's not going to translate when it's when it's being reproduced so kind of getting my head wrapped around that concept of no you can play with that energy you can play with that level of of intensity and that can just be pulled back in the mix and yeah right and then it's still going to have that body and it, it kind of hits on the point that the recording process puts a microscope on everything and one of the things that I find personally that I don't know that, that can be of most benefit is the focus on the style of articulation and like you said the energy in the room can kind of belie what comes across on the take and I find that quite often the most energetic sounding things that I've tried to record if I go after it with sheer volume and bravado uh, can fall slightly flat compared to going after a really punchy articulation and a really even uh, volume control so not swelling through the note hitting it hard and maintaining that thick articulated sound you can even see it in the waveform um it, it's really you can go in as deep as you want with that microscope yeah <laughs> but uh speaking of jerry i just want to show this because this is a bit funny um i picked up this slide trombone because i heard that gary grant and chuck findley um would track on slide trombone uh-huh and i was like uh sorry it's um my slide trombones there the soprano trombone or whatever you want to call this thing. Yeah. There's a wee Gatson. Um, but yeah, I, I picked this up hearing how oh, they, they recorded on this. I really want to get one and try it. My missus hates it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what, you see, uh, I mean, a bright sound and just as wide open as you could imagine. But um, you see for note bands and scoops, there's nothing like it. Um but I find it crazy to hear, was it a Grammy ceremony that uh, Chuck played lead on a slide trombone? Am I remembering that correctly? I, yeah. Or on a soprano trombone? Yeah, 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 no, yeah. Some people say soprano trombone, slide trumpet, whatever you want to call it. it yeah. Yeah, Chuck is just, he's, he's from another planet, I think, in terms of his play. That's, what's that about? I mean, it's hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, that's I hilarious. I, I don't, I don't, I don't get it sometimes, but uh, yeah, <laughs> hey, as long as they, as long as they keep making the music, man, I'll keep listening. Agreed. To it. Oh, me too, yeah. me too. And the, and those signs are just—it's all you need to be inspired to practice is hearing those people play their instruments so well. Yeah, well, you know, and and speaking of of past guests and and a former and not a former but a, a fellow uh, fellow resident of the UK, um, when I was talking to Tom Walsh, Tom was talking about how he kind of got involved in the, the, the tracking side of things, the technology, primarily as a way of him learning how to arrange and learning how to do things. It's like, okay, well, the best way, if I'm going to be you know trying to write stuff for a horn section, the best way to do it is to sit down and actually start recording myself and seeing how things sound and seeing how things lay and and, you know, I think this is where, you know, technology, the change in technology has certainly helped so many people out because, you know, when, when I was younger and, you know, first kind of breaking into the business, everything was to tape. So, yeah. you know, you were, it was the track limitations, you know, if you were lucky enough to get into a, a 32 track studio or, you know, 64 track studio, you were, you know, you were paying a lot of money to do that and time was money. So, you know, you, you had to be on your game and there, there was, there's not a whole lot of room, especially if it was a self-produced project, uh, you didn't have time to experiment. Um, but now with, uh, you know, 
home recording, especially the way it's progressed, uh, you know, over the, the past 20 years, 30 years, um, you know, going from, you know, small multi-track cassette machines to, to now, you know, completely digital formats, it's given people the opportunity to not have those limitations of track count. It's not having the limitations of, uh, you know, tape degradation or, or things like that that you, that you have to deal with. Uh, you, you have everything you need at your fingertips. And you know, I like what you had said about doing ABs. And I think that's such a, that would be a, a great way. And, and I've tried to, I've started playing around with that a lot more myself of doing something, tracking it, listening to it, trying it a little bit different and, you know, having to Frankenstein tracks from, you know, every once in a while, but it's learning that process and you know, like learning what waveforms look like that, that was, that was a big one of, of saying, okay, well, you know, if, if a waveform looks a certain way, I can just look at the track and say, this is going to be, this is too compressed. This is, you know, this has got too many peaks in it. And just being able to, to kind of eyeball and say, okay, well, this is going to be a good take before I even go to playback. So I think learning those things is, is such a critical part of what we need as instrumentalists uh, in, you know, the, the modern times. So, you know, when it comes to like your resources, you know, if you had to, if someone's coming up to you and saying, you know, hey, Michael, I really want to learn more about, you know, the, the process of, of recording for trumpet, where would you point them? First thing would be to understand, have they started the journey and do they have a little bit of equipment? Because I think the first <laughs> place I would point them is pick up your instrument put stuff together and just start trying things. And there's a fantastic DAW, uh, a digital audio workstation out there called Reaper. It's free to evaluate for 30 days, after which the license is, it's very cheap. So it's a wonderful piece of software with great stock plugins. And it's my preferred DAW, it's extremely powerful. Um, there's a little learning curve to it, but what I'm saying is, that software is there to be used. So put things together and just start goofing about and have a bit of fun. Go at it like when you first started playing notes on the trumpet and you were just kind of filled with excitement and um, you just were enjoying the sensation of making sounds and so on. Do the exact same thing and don't listen to anything and take it too much to heart in terms of where you are. You may want to be a lot further than where you currently are in terms of what you're hearing in your recorded sound. And it might be slightly disheartening, but you should flip that on its head and just take that as the most positive thing possible. You're somewhere and you can go somewhere better. And, you know, knowing that you can go somewhere better is a good thing. That's a very positive thing. So I think the first thing is using all of your current uh, assets and not overlooking anything. Um, so that's the first part to the answer. The second part would be uh, listening to a lot of stuff. I learned quite a bit about how microphones were being used just by making notes, um, looking at r studio sessions that were running and making notes about how I was seeing instruments, how I was hearing them, how uh, the microphones were placed, you know, what way did they uh, run when they did uh, second passes, how were they uh, taking down the instruments? Did they separate things? And that's that's a little more on the live side of things, the live horn section side, but the microphone positions are all there for a reason. They're, they're working in that scenario. So what does that room look like and how does it sound? Maybe through enough looking through YouTube, which is a wonderful resource, um, you're going to find things like, oh, in this specific, you know, small size of room or a room like my room, they tend to be placing here. And, you know, I've noticed that they're recording into these types of microphones or using this kind of plugins or presets. So just being observant about what's there. Uh, another part of the answer would be there's unbelievable amounts of incredible free audio resources on YouTube. Channels like uh, Mixing with Mike, which is not my channel, unfortunately. Um, uh, Mixing with Mike, there's uh, Pinsado's Place. 
um, and maybe a hundred others, uh, of which I probably follow 10 e each time they release something. And you will just learn a lot about the music production side of things. But um, if you just go online and search um, something like uh, horn recording, uh, DAW or something like that, uh, or horn recording plugins or something like that, you're going to find some well-regarded engineers giving their advice about how to use their plugins. So there's an awful lot of information to be had already just on YouTube before you have to pay for it. Um, there are, of course, books about recording technique. Uh, I advise anyone to read anything these days. <laughs> but uh, uh, feeling that, um, there's a good book published by Rutledge called Classical Recording Techniques. Uh, it's, it's quite detailed. It covers a lot of instruments. So you might only find on brass that there's six or 10 pages, um, but those are valuable pages. And in fact, I would just suggest you read the whole thing anyway, because you're learning the concepts of sound and perhaps you'll have a little bit more appreciation of how sound works. And that's really what we're dealing with here is, well, this abstract idea of what a trumpet sounds like is it's what does the room sound like, the mic sound like, everything in the signal chain sound like. And uh, to appreciate that, sometimes you need to see how other instruments are recorded and maybe you start to draw parallels between, let's say, the voice, the soprano voice and trumpet, and maybe those parallels exist in uh, performance of the instrument as well as the recording techniques. Um, they're not identical, but they're not dissimilar. Um, yeah, so, I mean, kind of a long-winded answer, but I think use what you've got. Ask people. I'm sure in your friends list you, you know some engineers. Ask questions. Copy what other people are doing. Um, use YouTube until you're sick of it because... There is just an unbelievable resource there for free. Um, and it's kind of on you to use it and find it. And then um, searching just recording techniques on Google and you'll find books and so on. Yeah, cool. Well, and of course, you know, listen to uh, this podcast and you'll get all yeah, the great, sure. you know, <laughs> yeah, great information about everything about trumpet, everything you need to know and some stuff that you probably don't want to know. Um, so that, this is a different question. Um, you also play bass. Correct? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I always have said that if I if I was to take up another instrument, it would be bass. Um, yeah. And I don't know why. It's just like you know, if I'm listening, if I'm listening to a track, a new track, and you know, comes on the radio or whatever, um, if it's the first time I've heard it, uh, the first thing I tend to to focus on is the bass. And then if horns come in, then I'm immediately listening to the horns. But but it's kind of those are the two things that, that capture my attention. Yeah. Um, what what drew you to bass? Well, it's a primal thing, isn't it? It's like drums and bass, and they're the instruments you maybe feel uh, at a at a concert more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's got that kind of guttural, um, primal feel to it, and I love that. Um, I, I learned guitar first and um, I taught far too many lessons and sort of lost the love of it because a lot of guitar students tend to be quite uh, transient in nature, um, especially around when I was teaching uh, Guitar Hero and then uh, talent shows and so on. They, the, the, the longevity of the student tended to be low, so you had a small percentage of great students that you love to teach and a huge percentage of turnover where you're teaching the same first lesson over and over to disinterested students. And if you do 60 of those lessons a week for 10 years, you start to lose the love for the instrument. Right. Um, so I just taught and openly will say I completely lost all interest in it. And then I, well, you see, I used to build guitars as well. And what got me into bass was in, I think, 2012, 2013, uh, I took a Warwick bass and 
the client at the time asked me to strip the fretboard off and put a fretless neck on. So I did that. Um, also, if we're talking, maybe you know what kind of worth this was, but you know, this is a $5,000 base, $6,000 base. Uh -huh. And he's saying it's the same. I don't know what the trumpet equivalent would be, but like take this beloved instrument and do something relatively aggressive to it. Yeah. Yeah, take take <laughs> Tear this, it yeah, apart 19, and rebuild it. Yeah, this, this 1930s uh, vintage New York Bach and... Uh, can can you can you give it like a a, a tie dyed paint job on it? Yeah. yeah, that that level of thing, and you're like, I mean, I know I'm not going to wreck the thing, but this feels weird. Yeah, um, yeah. So I did that, and I built the instrument, and obviously part of the process is playing it. Uh, and when I was playing it, I just thought, if I owned this instrument, I would learn how to play the instrument because I really enjoyed it. And a lot of the technique of the electric guitar transfers. Um, so it, it was a very quick learning curve for me. Uh, it, it, there was no real, there was no real struggles from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. There were things that had to mature in my approach because a guitar player thinks a certain way and a bass player thinks a different way. But technically and physically, uh, it was a very easy switch. So I switched on to it. And what I found was the nature of the single line was quite like trumpet. Mm -hmm. So I find that my um, reading on it was actually quite intuitive um, and learning bass clef wasn't particularly difficult um, because it's all single line, single melody notes, essentially. I mean, bass notes, but it's a melody of its own. Right. So I gravitated to it from that regard as well. I find it strangely like the trumpet. Uh, and as I've said before somewhere that uh, I kind of feel like bass guitar is kind of the rhythm sections lead trumpet. Y you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, it's like, yeah. if the bass decides to go somewhere else, you have to kind of go. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're in control of the harmony of the groove. Like mm -hmm. the bass is a, a pivotal instrument and I just kind of love that role of the instrument. Um, and then I also grew up listening to loads and loads of Herbie Hancock. So, you know, Paul Jackson's playing was just, you know, I'd listened to it for 20 years mm -hmm. prior to even touching a bass. And, um, that kind of realization that, well, now I can play those parts that I love so much. And, you know, that, that was kind of, uh, the final straw. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, man, I, I I thought that I would, you know, if I if I was going to pick up another instrument, it would be that. I mean, one of the reasons I haven't done that is that right now I don't have enough time to commit to playing my trumpet. So I right. I, I feel like okay, I've got enough on my plate right now. So, but you know, a lot of my favorite bass players um, were actually either trumpet players or, or played some sort of brass instrument, uh, like Nathan East. Who yeah. you know Nathan was a trumpet player. Um, uh, John Entwistle was you know a, a horn player, and uh, Flea was a trumpet player. Yeah. And, and it's it's interesting because uh, when you listen to some of the stuff that that just using those three as an example, I'm sure there are other other players out there that that uh, you know also play as well. But um, there's just, there's a quality about their playing that is a little more single line melodic and it's like yeah i can relate to those approaches very easily yeah. you know it's like oh yeah that sounds like a trumpet part just played on a bass but does, do you yeah, find, yeah right do you do you find that um you know having going from like being uh you know having a position like as a lead trumpet player and you said like the bass is kind of a lead trumpet of the of the rhythm section, but when you think about the 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 harmo the spread of the harmonic spectrum there, and going from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high, do you feel like that that uh, kind of gives you a, a different approach to music or a different awareness to the music? They could do. Yeah, it's certainly it's never far from my mind the the role of uh, melody and bass instruments and. In, a lot of pop music. I, I'd listened to an awful lot of, you know, pop and R&B and soul and jazz music. And it's really, 
it's important to recognize that when something's really powerful and really musically emo emotionally moving um the interactivity between the bass part and the melody line um and i think when you're able to recognize that it, it can kind of help your own uh skills maybe as an arranger or even just as listening to something it, it can help you appreciate it slightly more and yeah i mean I, like you said the first thing you notice in a song you notice the bass really really quick um and then when horns come in it's who's on this session yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly you, you, you're listening for the telltale signs you know yeah of course i yeah. love it yeah. um but listening to some of the great players like i love uh, the sister sledge bass lines are some of the best mm -hmm. bass lines in the industry like i just i could never get enough of that and there's something about the m melodic nature of those that's very horn like um there's a lot of really great leading tone playing in it there's a lot of excellent uh rhythmic development and like any good horn hook the the bass hook complements it you know it sets it off and yeah no I, I i love both yeah yeah i i, I think you know it, our attention gets drawn to the things that we're most familiar with you know yeah. and um it, it's actually a, a a meditation practice that that i've i've taught a number of people that uh you know to learn how to shift your awareness and as as a horn player and some of you who's had to pick pick horn parts off the record for you know gazillion years uh or to to learn uh background harmonies to do vocally or you know all these different things have to go on you know i've i've had to train myself to be able to as i'm sure you have as well to be able to switch my awareness so that i'm really listening to okay now what what's the trumpet doing what's the trombone doing what's the the sax doing and, you know when you're trying to transcribe and then you know if you're if you're a bass player as well and you're listening to well what's the bass line doing um and when you do that you have these subtle shifts of awareness and sometimes you hear things that you didn't hear before and then once you hear them you can't unhear them so yeah. the, the the awareness is there um so th that that's just like you were saying earlier about being able to you know training yourself to hear frequencies that's something that you know most people don't think about they you know they hear pitches but they don't hear frequencies they they couldn't tell where something has a boost or a cut or um so i i think that it for me those kind of listening skills and especially when you spend enough time doing that that you you start to develop a um a more complex uh experience as you're you're listening to music and, and you're you're starting to key and zone in on to to things that that are often missed and I think sometimes that uh, that's kind of the beauty of a, of a beautiful arrangement is that there are things that are going on that that go on that fly under the radar kind of intentionally um, that you know that it's nothing that's drawing your attention but it just if if it's taken away you would immediately go that doesn't sound right um, yeah. But then again, there there are other things I think sometimes people just do miss because they're too focused on you know what's the lead guitar player doing or what's the the vocalist doing and they're not listening to the the entirety of yeah. of the thing in terms of sonically and 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 also in terms of structure. I think that speaks to how developed your listening is, and it would be easy to say that your mind is probably only predisposed to focusing in initially on maybe one aspect of a tune and that could just be the lyrics or the the hook and i think it's something that as musicians we maybe take it for granted how much we develop our listening abilities um but not kind of uh cognitively it's it's through the the act of playing in ensembles and so on and maybe um it's something i've noticed that some players can maybe work on i think it would develop them is their ability to take on more from one listen um i learned a lot of this from my brother and i uh, dan's he's passed a few years now 
and is sorely missed, but the level of his hearing um, every single time we discuss music, it blew my mind. And I find this about great musicians, like my missus, uh, Melina. She has a deep connection and with music and her her listening is on a whole different level to mine. And it's through this intensive process of um, focus and awareness and it draws you in the more you do it. Um, I'll tell you a little anecdote about my brother. And Dan was a contemporary classical composer and he mastered a lot of the previous styles, Baroque and classical and uh, romantic, even Renaissance music. Taught himself a lot of instruments to learn how to play and compose in those styles better. But a, a really good story that I like to recall is he did a Kodai course, which is solfege, and he wasn't a singer, so he didn't have access to the course, but wanted to go. And he had to sit a, a basic entrance test, an aptitude test, and they played, um, I think it was a Bach four part chorale. And they just asked to identify the bass motion of a 30 second piece of music. And Dan wrote out the full 30 seconds all four parts and handed it in and said, I think there might be two mistakes in this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, so uh, I'm hearing the bass player playing and how the, you know, the, the hi hats and the, the snare and the kick are interacting with the bass and the horns come in. I'm happy about that. And then Dan sits and writes out perfectly four part back harmony. Yeah, I kind of have a ways to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's inspiring. And when I hear people like, and I know Jerry's this way from his interviews and hearing him talk about music, but uh, th that it's always like little false summits. I, the mountain just, you keep climbing yeah. and yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's scary. I mean, um, that's something I certainly, that's a skill I certainly don't have. Uh, and I certainly, Nor I. <laughs> I, I appreciate I, my, my dad had perfect pitch and, you know, I used to drive him crazy um, because I, I, I had imperfect pitch. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it just it was nuts. So um, but, yeah, it, it's it, it's interesting to see how the you know, we, everybody we, we, we have these different stratas that we're on and everybody's kind of got a different, yeah. uh, you know, different level. But uh, I certainly do think, though, that that. Um, being able to identify those different sounds and to not just identify them, but to associate with them. I guess that's probably the better word to associate is it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's really helped me develop my sense of pitch is working on in my car where no one can hear me singing and associating with songs, um, certain keys and moods, the more senses I think that you can involve in remembering Actually, I use this for remembering arrangements, but also for remembering um, pitch. Uh, the more things that you can involve in it, the better. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I did learn from Dan, but he he didn't have perfect pitch, but um, damn near. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, extremely good relative pitch, yeah. um, I would say. But that's that is uh, that's a good point. The involving. Um, as many senses as possible. Mm. Yeah, I like that. All right, well, we're going to uh, wrap things up here. We've got two sections to get through, two segments. And uh, the first segment is for all of our gearheads. If we haven't talked enough gear today, oh, we're going to talk, <laughs> talk more gear. Uh, so this, yeah, is, yeah. this is geared up. And, and in geared up, we're just going to talk about what kind of gear you're using. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you can give a little bit of insight into the specifics of your choices, that would be great, too. Sure. Um, trumpet gear or recording gear or both? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Let's start with the trumpet stuff because I'm a massive trumpet nerd. Um, this is some of them. Um, my go-to B-flat is my 37. This is a 1976, so it's an Elkhart, early Elkhart 37, medium-large. 
um, with the um, Louisville 12M lead pipe. So this is a, a Pickett Blackburn lead pipe. Um, yeah, this, that's it. It's pretty much stock from there. Oh, I have beautiful finger buttons on this one. I'm not sure that those all show up on video. Uh, I saw those on your uh, one of your, your recent posts. Yes, yeah, I'm those. always putting those up because they look class. Yeah. Uh, Jocelyn LaPointe in Canada made those. Nice. Um, that's my go-to horn. I do most of my recording on that. It's bright and focused. It feels a little lighter than modern box. I'm not sure if it is. It might be. Um, it seems to get on the mic pretty good. So that's my go-to. Um, Mouthpiece-wise is a Vizuti a Yamaha or uh, this AR Resonance. Um, yeah, it's like a 3C with a 19 throat um, they're, and, and a 3C. They, they would be the three mouthpieces. But uh, I've been prototype testing, beta testing some venture mouthpieces. Mm -hmm. um, so expect to see some more posts about that because Doug McVeigh Adventure is doing something quite remarkable. Absolutely. Um, He's, he's a walking genius and he's going to revolutionize the mouthpiece world. So yes, uh, indeed. Yeah. I expect, uh, I expect my choices will change soon, but, um, check them out. Doug's great. Um, my other B flat then. So my, my other B flat isn't here. Um, it's my brother's old instrument, which I need to have. Uh, restored. It's an old Bisher 254. But this is a curious little thing. Uh, my Yamaha parts horn. Um, so Lee McKinney at Eclipse in the UK put this together. Um, it's a reverse Carol Brass lead pipe. It's been reversed to play standard because I prefer standard lead pipes. A um, couple of braces added. We moved some braces. It's a 4320G bell, which I believe is a 6445 bell, large bore C bell. So it's like a 72 uh, in back terms. Um, there's a bit of heft to the instrument. It's actually quite heavy and it, it's open. So um, it, it's quite a good horn for, for loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually find that Having the openness is quite good sometimes. I do like to blow against a little resistance, but sometimes that openness can just help things vibrate a little better. And day to day, it's nice to have that option where I don't pick and choose based on my chops. But if I am knocking my head against the wall, I will pick one up and swap instruments and just see. Um, I do have a few other things here of a nice Getson 940 Piccolo. Um, talking about arranging stuff, then I use that on a lot of indie recordings and uh, singer songwriter kinds of things where I'm not necessarily playing it, you know, Penny Lane style. I'm mm -hmm. just using it as a high brass voice that doesn't take up loads of space. Mm -hmm. um, in that regard, you know, you might not even play it particularly high, but it's such a narrow sound. It's, it blends nicely. Right. Um, so that's a nice little thing. Obviously, my Getson soprano trumpet or yes. slide trumpet or whatever we're going to call it. Um, my Yamaha uh, cornet, um, which has had a few things swapped about on it. Um, French horn. That's just a student Yamaha French horn. I don't deserve any better. There you go. I can't. I can't pay for any better. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that too. Man, do you know the price of uh, French horns? You got to sell a whole lot of microphones to buy one of those things, man. My goodness. I, I thought trumpets were expensive. Yeah. Uh, turns out I'm wrong. French horns, man, that's the business. Yeah. Um, that and same thing, uh, my slide bone, I have a, a valve block for it there for when I actually have to play the right notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's about that. I have a few other instruments kicking around, but that's the tech stuff. Um I guess maybe because you can see I do a bit of doubling. Um, I should mention that. So when I'm doubling on this, um, I use a, I think it's, let's just get this right. I think this is, yeah, it's the Dave Steinmeier um, Marcinkowitz 
okay. uh, trombone might be. So that's quite shallow and quite cushioned. Um, Chris Tedesco put me onto this. Um, I find that helps my doubling immensely. Mm -hmm. And a little tip that I saw Mike Bogart from Tar Par fame, mm -hmm. uh, he put on his YouTube channel, which by the way, check it out. That guy straight up plays oh, yeah. amazing. He is serious. Um, and he doubles just incredible on trombone. Um, and his tip, and this has helped me so much, is placement. Um, place on the bottom lip where your trumpet mouthpiece would go. And I, it might not work for everybody, but that, wow, that has opened up the doors of my trombone playing. Hmm. Um, just to put that bottom rim where my trumpet rim sits. Uh, and one of Chris Tedesco's tips for me on the French horn was to put a trumpet rim on the French horn mouthpiece. So, um, ah, it's too high. On my lathe, I just chopped the rim off and stuck it on a Paxman under part. And there we go. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. a bit more comfortable. Mm -hmm. I didn't struggle necessarily playing French horn mouthpieces. Actually thought it felt quite nice and easy, even though they're very, very narrow rims. Mm -hmm. The struggle's not playing it. It's switching back to trumpet after two hours or yeah. an hour. Um, so it's always the the balance between, well, I have to get back on one of these at some stage. So I got to make, got to prioritize that over, you know, maybe five or 10% of my French horn sound, which let's face it, uh, no one's going to call me a French horn player anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, the last time I got um, called a French horn player, I had to punch somebody. So yeah, no, I mean that's yeah, that's, that's a response, an insult, isn't it? That's an insult. No, I used to play. For, I played French horn all through high school. So oh, really? Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I did, and uh, yeah, I actually i i enjoyed uh, i enjoyed playing French horn. Um, I love the instrument. Yeah. I love the sound of that instrument. Yeah. I truly do. Um, what what brought you onto the trumpet? Out of curiosity. Well, I mean, I was I was playing trumpet, but they, you know, I was I was playing in uh, uh, you know a high school where there was a uh, there weren't that many French horn players, and they sure. they needed somebody to to switch over to French horn, and I was like, eh, okay, why not? You know, yeah. so uh, I started playing French horn my sophomore year in high school, and and played concert and and uh, concert band and orchestra played. French horn and then you know trumpet and jazz band and everything else so um but yeah I, I actually I I enjoyed I enjoyed playing that and I think it really helped me on in some aspects of my yeah. playing um you know but yeah the, the 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 big difference was was after you know doing a a two-hour rehearsal and then you know trying to pick up my trumpet and play and I was playing like a a fairly large diameter trumpet mouthpiece at that time so yeah, like going back and forth between the two was was fun. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenge. And then talk about um, skating on thin ice, pitching on the French horn—that's an art. Oh yeah, those partials. Yeah. Um, speaking of the the horn, actually, my my flugel horn's in the case right now, but I play a one five two five, and Trent Austin's uh, ten and a half. Um, CDF, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. So it's a big mouthpiece, but from time to time, I'll pop in a beginner French horn mouthpiece um, with a bit of tape around the shank. And it's probably wrong. I mean, there's people on forums shouting at me right now, but you know, there's something about that massively deep mouthpiece that just sounds like butter. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pitch gets flexible though. <laughs> Yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's overrated, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that, that's yeah and on the recording side of things, I'll I keep this short. This is my Barkley Microphones Infinity second generation. Um, running into my I have an RME Fireface and straight into my DAW. I have some outboard preamps, um, but recently I've just been going straight in. Um, the preamps on this RME stuff is top shelf and you get a little bit more top end response out of it. The character preamps I run, I have like, um, I have 1073 clones and some other British, you know, transformer heavy designs. They're quite colorful and they're quite pretty. Um, but you, you sacrifice a bit of your high harmonics mm -hmm. and a bit of the 
transient attack, how fast the attack starts. And my sessions recently have been quite pop oriented, quite modern oriented. So I've been running straight into the, the high impedance input, um, or the, rather the high impedance preamps in my Fireface and it just, it pops. And then like we discussed our preamps, they're all simulated in uh, DSP now. So uh, in plugins, if I want that character, it's not exactly the same, but I can put an emulation of a console in my software if I want that, um, if I want that tonality. So I, I'm liking this workflow currently. It's quite simple. Um, yeah, you can you can go overboard for a while. I ran, you know, 12 U rack of tube gear yeah. and it sounds lovely, but I like simple sometimes. Simple is good. Simple is good. Simple, and I'm achieving the same results with plugins. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there you go. All yeah. right. Well, we've got one last thing to get through, and this is uh, our uh, Robinson's Remedy uh, rapid fire round brought to us by our friends at Robinson's Remedies, and a uh, series of questions all over the place. Just need your quickest answer to these questions. Okay. All right. And the winner gets a uh, Getson slide trumpet. Yeah, my missus has already put that on eBay, so. <laughs> You'll need a new one. <laughs> All right. Here we go, Michael. Um, who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? Wouldn't be one person, but my parents. All right. What's your favorite book? Um... The one I'm reading, I would say. Um, I don't have any particular favorites. I have lasting memories of uh, C.S. Lewis's books. I find those inventive. And I have lasting memories of the Red Dwarf books. It's a yes. UK comedy show, mm -hmm. space, set in space. So mm -hmm. there's two that have left an impression, but my favorite book is the one I'm currently reading. All right. That's a good answer. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Oh man, my dad got this DVD. Um, it was one of these, there's a, a, a studio that specializes in releasing copies of blockbuster films within weeks of the films coming out. And there was a big disaster movie. I forget the name of it. Um, and my dad accidentally bought the fake version and not the real one. And I think the moon splits in half in it. And it's just the worst thing I've ever seen. Uh. <laughs> and uh, in true fashion, my dad did finish the movie. And he's like, yeah, that, that was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. You know, once you, you're in, you, you just got to see how, how bad the does it actually way. get. Yep, there you go. <laughs> I, I've been in those situations way too many times. Oh, man, I know. All right. Um, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? Probably an engineer. Okay. Um, and you uh, could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Probably invisibility. Mm, and, <laughs> and I don't want to know why. <laughs> um, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? I think the, probably the good answer is high notes. Um yeah, I think I think probably high notes. Okay. Uh, what aspect do you feel do you feel is the most underrated? There would be a few. Um, probably listening, um, diverse listening, and not necessarily only to music that you like to listen to. Um, if we're doing one answer, there, that one. Okay. Um, you could go back in time. And uh, give your younger self one piece of advice. What would it be about music? Yeah, that's very hard to answer. Uh, probably, probably go to more concerts. That would be that would be a good answer. All right. Uh, what advice would you give yourself about life? Generally, uh, trust your instincts and have more self confidence and more self worth. Um, potentially not to externally source your self-worth. Find that internally. I learned that too late. Okay. 
Uh, what's your favorite drink? I'm quite fond of an old fashioned. That would be one of my mm. favorite drinks. That's a good one. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you uh, could have a dinner party and invite any three living people. Who would they be? Right now, it would just be family members to see them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in in standard circumstances, it's a fun, a fun thought process you would need to think about. But, I mean, I would love to talk to Winton at a dinner party. Mm -hmm. I think that would be pretty fun. Probably invite a chef, just pretend like we're going to have them there for the crack and just get them cooking. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, you have any number of chefs we can have. And then maybe, well... I have Jerry Hay there, yeah. man. It's my party. There you go. It's your party. <laughs> All right. Uh, good. And so you have three additional seats at that same table. You can invite any three people from history. Any three people that are no longer with us can be at that party. I find it probably interesting to talk to Carl Jung. I, yeah, I, I find him an interesting person. Um, Maybe one of the great inventors, like Edison. Um, Louis Armstrong. Okay. That's a good party. Um, yep. Lacquer plated or raw? Raw. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite quote? Oh, man. Anything that Groucho Marx came up with. <laughs> <laughs> one of his quotes was, I'd never be a member of a club that would have me as a member yep. or something like yep. that. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Um, what's your greatest fear? Not realizing my potential. All right. And what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, that I had done something in some way that made someone's life a little better. And maybe I left a memory perhaps of kindness or thoughtfulness and, um, Maybe potentially inspired somebody to do something, anything that they committed to, not necessarily music, but inspired them just to be a better person, perhaps. Yeah, Is, yeah maybe that's a little egotistical to say, but no. yeah, I'd like to think that I could, maybe one person, if I can get one person... Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, Hey, that's, I think ultimately that's, that's what we should all be, you know, shooting for just, you know, to make, make the world a little bit better, you know, for yeah, not just right. for ourselves, but just, but, but for somebody else, you know, just, just for the sake of being better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, Michael, I really uh, appreciate you taking your time to be with me today and to get to know you and uh, everything that, uh, that I've heard about you is, is, uh, Actually, an understatement. You are uh, <laughs> definitely a, 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 a very thoughtful and insightful person. And uh, I really look forward to getting to know you a lot better and to uh, seeing what you come up with next. Because, uh, you know, I, I know there are tons of ideas rattling around in that head, and uh, <laughs> both in terms of, of what you're doing with, uh, with Barkley Microphones, but also musically, uh, just you know, some tremendous stuff. So, um, you know, I really appreciate everything that you're doing to make, uh, make life a little bit easier and a little more enjoyable for us trumpet players. Thanks so much for having me. Honestly, it's a, it's a pleasure talking to you and I appreciate, and I've always thought this and wanted to say to you in your, uh, interviews, I love how you, you practice the art of listening and you're a very, um, excellent host for us all i think i i keep coming back to your videos and and just appreciating how well and how naturally they all flow uh, and thank you for actually putting this channel together and uh, and doing this oh thank you it, it's my pleasure uh as one of my teachers always told me uh it's like uh, you know you think that i do this you know, for you, I do it for me. So, uh, you know, it, for, for me to be able to sit down and talk to some of my heroes and to make new friends, um, that's what it's all about, man. This is, this yeah. is so much fun. And uh, I look forward to the day that we can actually sit down in person 
and uh, and have a uh, have an old fashioned and a new fashion yep. and an out of fashion oh, yeah. and and, <laughs> and whatever all the fashions. yeah all the fashions and uh, <laughs> you know uh, and you know when when I can uh, scrape enough ducats together I, I'm I may be uh, look eyeing up one of those uh, wonderful Barkley uh, microphones uh, so uh, I, I may have to talk to the to the studio that I work out of and say. You know, I think we need to buy a ribbon. So. Yeah, yeah, tell him I know a guy. I know a guy who knows a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so um, I'll put the, there'll be links to uh, all the good stuff uh, in the show notes. So uh, definitely, if you're looking for a ribbon microphone, you definitely want to check uh, Michael out. He's he's just, uh, he's doing great things and uh, it, it's not going to break the bank. So it might dent it a little bit, but it's not going to break it. So, but, uh, you know, certainly... Uh, support him in uh, in what he's doing. And as always, thanks for hanging with us today and peace and slide grease. We're out. Peace. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of valve oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signor. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group. Mm-hmm.